Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading property experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, and Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investment Professionals of Australia, and the 2014 and 2015 Property Investment Advisor of the Year. All right, folks, you're on The Property Couch, where each week Ben and I bring you the Insider's Guide to Property Finance and Money Management. Hello, mate. G'day, bud. How are you? I'm terrific. Good. Why are you terrific? Because you gave, up a, you gave up a 50-point lead <laughs> to lose a certain... Uh, to, to win. certain yeah. four points. It was oh, well. terrific. Yes. No, so well, look, good things come out of bad things. Oh, and that go. is that when we play to the best of our ability, we can beat the best team in the league. Like the, you know, on That's top, how you see that. I do. I see that you know, for half there and the first two goals of the third quarter... We got up to 50 points in front, and then we decided to, you know, try new things. To choke. Not stick to the you game plan. decided to choke. We it was brilliant. Choke. Nerido is our special guest today. <laughs> How good is it to see Collingwood choke? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, we're going straight to the... Nerido, I stay neutral here. Yeah, like, and she doesn't do football. Yeah. That's right, she doesn't do football. football. She's a Melbourne girl, <laughs> lives in Sydney. We'll get to, we'll get to Nerido. Those dockers. Hey? Yeah, about the doggers. Mate, I've gone off the footy banter, so... <laughs> yeah, for, that reason, for, that, for that reason. For that reason. Um... A couple of quick ones before we get to Nerida because yes. we've got lots of cool stuff to chat with her about. Really exciting uh, month, isn't it, Ibis? Yep. yep. There she goes. Oh, for effect. Uh, the, <laughs> like the bikini. <laughs> it's August. No, it's August. <laughs> August. Oh, gee, brilliant, Mark. We are. Uh, did who you like came that? up with that one? Ibis did. That's why I gave her an opportunity. Are you on drugs, Ibis? <laughs> no. I think, I think we might. Okay. That a, that's brilliant. Now, let's spell it A W E dash G U EST. August, <laughs> August. August. Because we are going for two episodes a week oh. for all of August because we've got terrific We've got to turn guests. up twice a week. We've got to turn up, to turn up twice. Oh, happy to turn up. Sad, sadly for the New South Wales listeners, they've got to listen to your uh, footy banter. But um, Well, we'll only talk footy in one of those. As long as they keep, ch- as long as they keep <laughs> choking, I'm happy to talk about it. But um, So, yes, yeah, so we have got some terrific um, guests lined up this month. Uh, and, of course, Nero Connors is going to kick that off. All star today. guest month, is it? August, August. Right. Gee, so, brilliant. There we, there we go. Uh, another awesome development. Is on... that a hashtag? Should we hashtag that out? Is that... Yeah, you bet. Ibis. <laughs> Look at you. you... Ben, ben... Oh, I was taking a joke and they're all serious. Ben, like, that thing is brilliant. Ben's, Ben's going to go on to uh, his social media. Um, another exciting development on the couch is, uh, Ben, if you go to the property couch. Okay. Dot, dot com. Dot au. Yes. There's a little widget at the side of the website that you can press the button. And you can leave us a voice message. Ooh. And here's the deal. If anyone's got a question that they want us to answer on the podcast, if they go and leave a message on the website, we will prioritize it, Ben. It'll go straight to the top now, of the Now, that is exciting. That and is exciting. It's the people's podcast, Ben. <laughs> yeah. So not only will they get their question answered, they'll actually yeah. be able to hear yeah. their question being answered. So don't leave us a message that you have forgot the milk and you'll be home five minutes late. <laughs> We're actually asking for questions, aren't we? Questions. So yes. um, Great. exciting initiative, Ben. Yep. And also a shout out to our listeners. We, we actually want to get some people on once we get through all guests. Oh. Ben, there's one other one for you. Once we get through the month, we actually want to get people onto the podcast who have actually implemented the strategies we've been talking about mm. for the last 120 episodes. Wow. Now, it was very easy for us to go and get our clients on and then everyone goes, oh, that sounds very yeah. flavoured. Yeah. So we want to hear from people who aren't necessarily our clients, no. but they're loyal listeners of the podcast and they've been listening to the principles now and they want to come and tell us all about it. Leave your details on that voicemail. And we'll get you on soon, Ben. Oh, and so, and if people do want to say, you know, thanks for sharing the information, then we, we'll take those messages as well, won't we? We will. But uh, we've got a very special guest, Ben. We so, do. So um, let's get straight into it. We've had Nerida on before, Ben. We do. And, and I've got have. to say, I don't know if you know this, Nerida, but it was a very, very well-received um, episode of the podcast. We had people writing in saying, getting more of that on. So uh, Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me here. Now, for those of you who didn't listen to episode 94, where Nerida was on last time, she's the chief economist at the REA Group, realestate.com.au. For those of you who don't know REA Group, she appears every Saturday on Sky News Real Estate Program, fortnightly column for the Australian property commentator for the Eureka Report. She's a regular con- contributor to media outlets, including the Property Couch, Ben, um, <laughs> and sits on a number of property-related boards. You are busy. I am busy, How yes. do you juggle that? <laughs> 
Yeah, wow, I didn't know it was that much. Yeah. <laughs> Key question is, do you want to be on the property couch board? Yeah, <laughs> hey, not much to do. We uh, sort of uh, very, very, very little prayer. Can we just get to the content? She needs to catch a plane to go and write some articles. <laughs> well, if it wasn't for you talking about 50-point losses, we'd be there. <laughs> um, so I noticed recently you'd uh, travelled to Europe. Was that business or pleasure? Were you checking Research. out markets around around the world, or was it, it, it just? It was pleasure, uh, yeah. but you know, as a property person, I couldn't help but keep an eye on the market as what was happening in London and Italy and the likes. So what, what were your observations from that perspective in terms of uh, the property markets? Yeah, I mean, UK is fascinating at the moment. Brexit is rapidly putting that economy into recession. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty in that market. Uh, but the property market's quite interesting in that parts of Britain are doing very well, notably London. London's mm-hmm. continuing to see a lot of foreign capital pouring in. Prices yep. are continuing to rise. But the rest of Britain is really struggling with prices. So it's um, it's quite variable. Good there. yields, I hear, in some of the northern parts. Yeah, yeah absolutely. UK. I mean, yeah. if values fall, yeah. you know, rents aren't, you know, still enough demand from people wanting to live yeah, there. And, yeah. and that's keeping keeping rental levels up. Lessons to be learnt there from that sort of London effect because Melbourne and Sydney have a, a bit of that sort of um, local region money pouring into those markets as does some of that sort of Western Europe money going into to London. Is there some parallels there? Yeah look definitely. I mean if we have a look at regional areas of New South Wales and Victoria there is a lot of capital city money pouring in. Tasmania is another one. We are seeing pretty strong growth in Tasmania as a result of uh, capital city money again. You know when we have a look at where people are searching mm. and when we look at people who are searching particularly in places like Hobart. Mm. Uh, it's not just people from Sydney and Melbourne, but people across Asia now. Mm. So, you know, that, that affordability really drives a lot of interest. Is Tasmania sustainable from your point of view? You, you, you call it capital city money, but, um, you know, the locals have got to rent it and the locals have got to sort of be able to sustain the market. Where do you see it sort of in the medium to long term? Look, I think you have to be careful. I mean, Tasmania in total is only 700,000 people. Mm. So it is very sensitive to Mm. a lot of money pouring in. It's very sensitive to new levels of supply. I think though what makes Hobart quite different to the rest of Australia is that it hasn't seen much development. So, Mm. you know, places like Adelaide are quite small, but there's been a lot of apartment development. And we haven't seen much in Tasmania. So it, it is supporting rents at the moment. It's supporting prices, but, you know, the market can turn quite mm. quickly and I think if you're an investor there you know tread very carefully and mm. just understand it is a very cyclical market. So what's the job story down there like at the moment is there any um, green shoots or is it, is it even more positive than green shoots? There's some jobs growth but you wouldn't say it's a Melbourne Sydney story yeah. I mean it, it is primarily a government employment area mm. yep. uh, it's not a high growth economy mm-hmm. you know there's a bit of population growth yep. but it's not yep. strong so again small market be really careful. And that's what you've got to look out for so when you are seeing population growth even into some of these regional areas if that population growth is coming from say the 60 plus you know the grey rinse type people coming out to those areas to retire well their incomes aren't going to grow if any effect their actually incomes are going to be lower so that's not going to put that underlying pressure in pushing values high yeah absolutely and you do need to look at those factors particularly in places like gold coast you know gold coast at the moment is going crazy on our side Mm. we're seeing huge amount of uh, rental demand huge amount of buyer demand but the commonwealth games are coming up there's infrastructure spending you Mm. know that will flow through correct and i think you do need to be careful yeah yeah good point It'd be interesting to see the, the Tasmanian market too. If people are being big chunks of cash and they go down there, it's not as if they want to live in a house around Hobart. They want a nice acreage estate, you know, with the rolling hills and the nice outlook. So I guess you, you, one of the safety nets from having people going down there is if they are paying cash, that's um, going to help sustain that market. But they're probably not going into the capital cities, are they? Well, look, they, 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 they have to I mean. a bit. I mean, yeah. when we looked at uh, where demand was probably 12 months, 18 months ago, a lot of it was kind of inner city Hobart. Mm-hmm. And I think it had a lot to do with younger people being priced out of Melbourne and Sydney, mm-hmm. looking at those areas, seeing cool bars, restaurants, close proximity to the city, uh, period homes, you know, yeah. historic homes, and they yeah. like that. But it is now spreading out to the outer suburbs and, you know, that, that rural sea ch- um, I guess mm. sea change or uh, whatever. Tree, tree change. <laughs> tree change, yeah. yeah. That's, that's I mean, what people you know, are looking for. Sample of one, but I, I know of a couple of my um, my parents' friends who at that lower socioeconomic area and, and don't have a lot of money, they decided to sell up out of Melbourne mm. to and move down to Tassie because the cost of living. Mm. And they, you know, so they were able to obviously cash out of their property here and they were on the, you know, the outskirts sort of Dandenong, past the Dandenongs there. Mm. So not a huge, you know, sort of value set, but still enough to basically give them a $250,000 house with mm. change mm. to be able to For then lifestyle. sustain them. Because, you know, the reality is a pension is just, 
you know, it's just not enough mm. to, to live in a, in a big capital city like Melbourne and Sydney. Oh, beautiful fresh air down there as well. So it's, um, I remember the first time I went there was in October and, you, and just the, the perfect time of the year to see why people would make that migration. Mm. It was amazing. You talked about the Gold Coast. Is that, That's a bit of a boom bust town. I mean, it's obviously good now. Um, do you see that being sustainable given that the trends for population growth are largely around those sort of coastal clusters up and down the east coast? Do you see it sort of being more of a Maturing. mature market mm. instead of that boom bust? Yeah, look, it is. It's becoming more mature. And, I, you know, I'm really positive on the Gold Coast, but it's not a market that is stable mm. over the long term. And, mm. you know, it is a market that people tend to overbuild and there does tend to be a lot of investment activity in clusters over mm. time. Uh, I think the positives for Gold Coast, you know, it is almost becoming a, a, a region of Brisbane. You know, that, yeah. that area is really yeah. starting to merge together. Yep. There's a lot of interest from younger people, particular it offers lifestyle it offers you know beaches, beautiful, lifestyle. beautiful yeah. lifestyle you know so there's lots of reasons that people want to live there and you know particularly people in Sydney who you know a lot of people live in Sydney because they love the beach but trying to afford a home in Bondi mm, is yeah. next to impossible mm-hmm. now but go to Gold Coast and you can probably still get a house you know within walking distance to the beach and population expected to double by 2050 so that's a that's a significant increase on a geographically um, limited, you know, hinterland at one end, you've got the ocean at the other, and then you've got the border of the south. So it's there's, there's a kind of a bit conspiring to sort of help that sort of maturity of that market, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And and things like the infrastructure spending is such a positive. You know, mm. if you look anywhere where they put good rail or good buses or, you know, any good mm. public transport infrastructure, it does tend to drive activity. Mm. Uh, let, let, um, let's throw Sunshine Coast into that mix as well. What we've also seen is some reasonably good town planning around sort of reallocating their CBD and starting to get, you know, businesses like UE and that type of thing to come in and sort of relocate their their headquarters to... Because, I mean, the reality is if I'm going to work at, a, you know, sort of an average income job, I want to have some upside. And the upside for the Sunshine Coast is lifestyle, weather, all of those things. So I don't need that, you know, one you know $600,000 salary to live in Bondi right. to have that lifestyle. I can get that on a $75,000 salary up there and, and have, you know, the work-life balance that most of us who are trying to earn the $600,000 salary are aspiring for. Yeah. I hope my wife doesn't listen that too early. She wants to live on the Sunshine Coast hinterland and uh, sort of saying, over time, over time. <laughs> I'm liking the big city at the moment. Um, the uh, Before we go around the grounds with the rest of the market, when we uh, caught up with you last time, Trump was nice and fresh at that time. Yes. What, yes. what have you observed um, since you know he came into office and how that's playing around the economies and what sort of impact that might have on Australia? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the US economy is continuing to grow very strongly. Uh, interest rates are rising over there and, you know, that's starting to flow through to our banks and mm-hmm. they're starting to have to charge higher rates to us. You know, that a lot of their money that they lend to us is wholesale funding that comes out of the US. So, mm. you know, that's not great if you're a homeowner and your mm-hmm. mortgage rates are going up. Um, but, you know, the, it is, you know, it's so unstable over there at the moment. And same in the UK, you know, there's so much going on with Trump. You know, I, I think, you know, the next 12 months are just going to be very, very interesting. It just seems to be so chaotic over there that it's it's uncertain whether that level of economic growth will continue. Have you seen any impact? To, like, it seems to be from the outside observer, Ben likes politics more than I do, but it seems like everyone's just in this waiting pattern for him to sort of serve out his time and then the next one comes and they can take it seriously again. Is that, you know, how's that affecting... Um, you know, the economies around the world that are impacted on that. And do you feel that that's kind of a holding pattern scenario or do you think that some serious stuff will get done in the next um, in the next part of his term? Look, I don't know. You mm. know, I, I just, yeah. I think, you know, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a waiting game and it does seem that the, the world economy, you know, is going pretty well mm-hmm. at the moment, mm-hmm. despite all this political mm-hmm. uncertainty, but mm-hmm. that can change very quickly. Uh, yeah, at the moment, when we have a look on site and, and look at what people from overseas are doing on, on site and the way they're viewing Australia, they're, they're still very positive about mm. Australia. Mm. Uh, they still want to invest here. If anything, all that political turmoil and the fact that the world economy is moving to growth is, is making Australia look even more attractive. Mm. And, you know, that's, you know, positive for us, I guess, that, that people want to be here. Any views on the dollar? in terms of what's happening with the US and the trade weighted index? Yeah, I mean, it's hit 80 again. Yeah, yeah, so it's, um, <laughs> you know, it, it does um, yeah. put into question any further rate rises. You know, most of us are thinking rates will remain stable. Mm. Uh, 
for the rest of the year. And, and beyond, potentially. Yeah, yeah potentially yeah. beyond. Mm. I think, though, regardless of what the Reserve Bank does, rates are going to increase for home buyers yep. and it's going to become more expensive and we do need to all prepare ourselves for, for higher mortgage payments. Yep. There what do you think? Is. You heard it first. That's a <laughs> scoop. Absolutely <laughs> listen to that. Make sure you are getting the house in order when it comes to cash flow. Do you see that putting pressure on households that have hocked themselves a fair bit through the Sydney boom in particular? Yeah, look, it'll put pressure on people. Mm. and but it's, it's going to be interesting to watch it because banks are going to have to move very carefully because, you know, the majority of their loans are with people who have bought homes. Mm. And if people start defaulting, yeah. that mm. would just be an absolute disaster for them. It'd be a disaster for the Australian economy if people start defaulting totally. on loans. But yeah. for the banks, I think, you know, they'll move carefully. Uh, they'll try and avoid defaults, um, but they'll continue to be under pressure from their cost of wholesale funds. There's a new banking tax coming mm. in. Mm. Uh, are at them to be more moderate with their lending. So, you know, they're under pressure. Uh, if the Reserve Bank does start to increase rates, again, that's further pressure on, on what they have to charge home buyers. So uh, they'll move carefully, but, you know, they, they are under pressure. So just, just running out the, the international scene, um, with the changes to the foreign investment uh, regime and the taxes that we're looking at here, what have you noticed for the Chinese buyers and, and international buyers coming to Australia? Yeah, so the Chinese buyers have dropped off. Yep. Uh, not not a lot. We've seen this massive run up in mm. interest and we saw a drop off uh, to the, the end of the financial year of around 4% in the number of property seekers from China, in particular looking at Australian property. Uh, the drop-offs tended to be in places like Sydney. Um, I think, though, it may also have to do with the construction cycle slowing as well. So okay. there's less for them to buy. Yep. So that that's yep. also seems to be a factor that influences demand. So. Are you seeing any data coming through? My next-door neighbour is a property lawyer. I caught up with him on the weekend, and, and he deals a fair bit with uh, the Chinese market. And he was basically saying that um, there has been a fair bit of defaulting going on. So he works on both sides of the settlement uh, process, and he's sort of saying that, Yep, there's a few that have abandoned their purchases and that type of thing. Is there any data coming through to suggest that? Not, not really. I yeah. mean, there, there are, there is talk, but you hear of, um, you know, foreign buyers not being able to settle. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing though that a lot of them seem to, you know, it come, when it comes to the crunch, they get the money. Yeah. And <laughs> you know, they're probably not getting it from Australia yeah. in many cases because a lot of Australian banks aren't lending to offshore buyers. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's interesting looking at a market like China that very few people actually have home loans. The proportion of people with home loans is very low. Uh, that does tend to be a tendency to families to sort of get yep. together and buy something yep. that, and you know that, that, that family office approach yes. um, done through Vietnamese families and Chinese families and also you know Italians, Italians groups, they yeah. all they all did it we need to learn something about that especially if we want to buy into the Sydney and Melbourne markets mm. When you're in um, in London and you're catching up some friends, was that a big topic around parents helping their kids get into the market? Did that ever come up in conversation? Not or? so much. Yep. I mean, everyone's just watching it really closely. Yep. And I, I think what's in so interesting about London is Brexit is leading to a lot of uncertainty, but the pound's falling in value. And so suddenly you have a lot of people from overseas yeah. being able to buy at a cheaper rate. So yep. it's, it's leading to this massive inflow of foreign capital that they probably didn't want as a result of Brexit. Mm. So the other thing with London or with the UK is that they don't have restrictions on foreign buyers. So anyone can buy anything. Yeah. And if you're wanting to buy in the UK and you think it's cheap, London's, you know, London's the, the preferred point yep. of call. So yep. Pretty cool. As an economist, what are the, you know, you talked about before the exchange about the dollar. Um, what are the key metrics that are on your radar all the time as an economist for you to sort of um, keep the heartbeat of the economy? Put? Yeah, I mean, in terms of housing, it, interest rates is the big one. Mm -hmm. If we have a look at demand on site, any movement in interest rates leads to a change in demand. So mm -hmm. interest rates go up, demand drops off. You know, conversely, interest rates drop, demand demand increases. So that's the big one. And there's a reason that most people in the property mm -hmm. market watch interest rates mm -hmm. so closely. Uh, but you know everything unemployment is really important I think particularly not so much on a national level I mean obviously it's important but when we look at um, capital city markets mm. it's really important that if unemployment is rising that is very very bad news for mm. property markets mm. because you know if people you know, people will do most things to try and keep their homes. Uh, you know, they'll cut things out, they'll not take a holiday. But if you lose your job, that's mm, that's yeah. a really dire situation. So uh, particularly Melbourne and Sydney at the moment, you know, things are looking very expensive, um, but things are looking fairly stable. But if that unemployment rate starts to rise, that, that could get really tricky. 
And the view of um, you know the, a lot of the the changes that have come through to put a handbrake on the investors, largely is for the two Melbourne and Sydney. But um, have you observed in travelling around the country what impact that's having on the other states? Because you know Perth could do, do with a a little injection. You know Darwin. What, what, what's happening on the on the ground in those markets from your sort of perspective? Yeah, I mean, Perth is just so tough at mm. the moment. I was there at a conference in, in June and uh, it was a conference of primarily developers. And, you know, the fact that that economy was just going nuts and then a handbrake was hit, mm. it has just been really, really tough for that market. So they're grappling with how to increase demand. Um, there's a lot of talk about trying to, to operate in a market where federally the, the government is trying to slow things down, mm. where you don't want things to slow mm. down, you yeah. want things to speed up. So I think there's a, a bit of a sense of unfairness of, mm. as to how like, as to what's occurring over there. Places like Brisbane, I think, you know, when we talk about oversupply, that's a market that does seem to be most hit. You know, mm. Melbourne does seem to be absorbing that enormous level of supply that we've seen, but, but Brisbane is a little bit slower, uh, not I- impacting all property types. Mm. Not, it does seem to be kind of secondary investment grade stock mm. apartments mm. that, you know, you probably yourself may not want to live in, mm-hmm. but, you know, they're being marketed to investors. You know, that seems to be the problem area. But there's some amazing properties on offer in Brisbane. Yeah, the price disparity at, between and City is ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, you look at some of those properties on the Brisbane River and, mm. you know, amazing developments, amazing views, beautiful quality, and, and the prices are pretty good at the moment. <laughs> so, you know, I think you have to have a long-term view of Brisbane, but it's, um, it is a market that's worth looking at. Look, our, our team on the ground is looking at houses and the demand is exceeding the supply for A and B. Yes. properties yeah oh for houses still yeah. off the charts mm. i mean it's yeah. still it's interesting when we look at our property demand index for houses versus apartments that mm. houses for brisbane's fine you know there's no issues mm. with demand there apartments is a bit wobbly but mm. but definitely for for houses it's all good so coming back to those developers and and the perth market for a minute um, I'm interested in your views. Has there been any conversations you've had around setting maybe loan to value ratios based on postcode? So, you know, looking at different ways in which the, the government can intervene on a macro level. Um, what are some of the things you've heard out there and, and do you have any opinions on, you know, what would be the next thing you might do in the event that you need to continue to curb Melbourne and Sydney's growth? but you want to stimulate these other markets. Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think the banks are doing it naturally anyway. Yep. I mean, you, you hear of their black books of places they either won't lend in or yep. that they're very restrictive of lending. So I think it's, it is up to the banks. And, you know, ultimately it does depend on our financial stability that they're lending appropriately and, and not lending too much in areas that are considered yep. high risk. So, so I think that's really important. Uh, I think in markets like Sydney and Melbourne, uh, you do, you, you can't really have a federal approach. And I think that's, that's been a bit of a challenge that in a market like Sydney, where you've been underbuilding for decades, yeah. it's it's really a supply problem. And you look at Melbourne and Melbourne's not so much a supply problem. So, uh, you know, Melbourne at the moment probably doesn't have enough houses to make housing affordable, but there's plenty of apartments yeah. and apartments are very yeah. affordable. It's an Melbourne. expectation problem in Melbourne. It yeah. is, You yes. could live in an apartment, very affordable, but I don't want to. Yes. So my expectation is I should be able to have a house like my parents did Whereas that generation has passed out of New South Wales because, you know, they started building more apartments in uh, 1992 or thereabouts compared to we only started building more apartments than houses since 2012. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. It's, you know, there's this generational shift that's got to happen for people to sort of say, if Melbourne's going to move to 4 million people, guess what? Yeah, we can keep going wider, but no one's going to sit in the car for two hours mm. to come into their place of employment and there won't be any room on the trains unless you want to train surf on the roof, mm-hmm. you know, and that's illegal. So, you know, let's get real about... We can't put that forward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't do that, boys and girls, don't do that. So it's, so it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, that's because that is, it, it's an expectation thing that we've got to potentially move as opposed to a real housing affordability issue. Yes, you know, it is interesting when you talk to first home buyers in Sydney that it's pretty normal to buy a ha- a, an apartment yeah, in is. Sydney as a yeah. first home buyer. But yeah, you, you talk to them in Melbourne, a lot of them in Melbourne, and there is that resistance that prefer a house in Richmond, not mm. so much an apartment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, you know, and I get it, it's you know, it's, right. it's hard it's to right. change, you know, like you don't. <laughs> You kind of want what you want, you know, yep. and it's yep. it, it's tough, but there are, you know, people have to make sacrifices. Yeah, and that lines up to supply and demand. I mean, you know, as an investor or someone looking to buy in an area, 
you absolutely want the owner occupier appeal you want the lifestyle drivers but you potentially this is that practicality thing you have in your mind that this is more practical this is what i want and i'm not going to stop before i get it and you put enough of those people onto a limited supply of opportunities and you force growth yeah. yeah, and I suppose the other thing too that people worry about in, in Melbourne is, is capital growth yep. in their property. Housing has done better from a capital growth perspective. But apartments can do well too. You know, if you yep. buy a well-located apartment mm. in a good building, you know, it, it's probably going to go up potentially just as much as a house. So, you, you know, depending where you buy. Obviously, yeah, yeah, but, yeah. You know, but, but you over the longer term, well. you're totally right. I mean, Melbourne will make that shift. And our one-bedroom apartments one day will be worth $650,000 or more. And our two-bedroom apartments might have a median of a million dollars in that sort of inner ring. So, yeah, it's it's ultimately going to push that way. Yeah, I mean, certainly the case in Sydney now, an apartment in premium suburbs, well over a mil. You know, yeah. you're looking at Bondi 1.1 1, 1. 1 for, a, for a small apartment. Yeah, so so it's happened there now. It's crazy. With your fortnightly column in The Australian, what, what uh, is there, a, you know, an increasing need to find new ways of saying similar topics or is there always something fresh and relevant that you can say in terms of what you're seeing in the property market? Uh, look, there's always something. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I cover off commercial property as well. That's mm. um, a fair bit of my career has been spent in commercial property. So, you know, things like Amazon coming in and that impact on, yeah. on industrial and on retail. Was, was an interesting one uh, but the, things change quickly with residential that from one month to the next you start to get new data mm. about the most popular suburbs and where people want to live mm. and uh, you know we look at new ways we're always sort of cutting the data mm. differently so mm. you know we can tell where overseas buyers want to be and we can tell where young people want to be you know there's just always so much information it's often just trying to think of what people want to hear about. And just on that, I mean, you, you have, I mean, I, I follow you on Twitter and I get some of those feeds and your LinkedIn stuff. It's really great. And you, you, you send out those insights. What's in the last couple of months been one of your more favourite sort of insights that when you've cut the data and you've found out, so, you know, where young people want to live, what sort of some of the insights you've got there? Yeah, so I suppose the market ones are ones that people kind of like a regular update on. I mean, for me, the, the more interesting ones are long-term solutions to things like affordability. There was yep. one one I wrote recently around communal living, and this is what a topic that came up at a, a recent event, a, a lifestyle launch, actually. I was talking to a, a landscape architect, and she was quite young. She was in her 20s, lived in Sydney. She's, you know, like, she said, really I'm never going to afford to be able to buy a home on my own. Um, I share, you know, I'd be quite into, you know, I wouldn't mind living in a communal environment mm. if mm. that was a, a way for me to get in the market. So uh, it started to look at that as, as a bit of a topic. And uh, it's interesting in the States now, there's kind of these communal models that are being developed. And, and basically, they're, they're like a hotel. Mm. So you're living in a fairly small apartment without a kitchen, potentially mm. without any living areas, but you have shared living areas, you have shared kitchens, you may share a pool. You you know, there may be an on-site chef, there's cleaners, you know, so they're kind of yeah. these different no environments. Place. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't want to live there? Yeah. So, you know, I think that's the thing. Like, we do need to be a bit, uh, ima- not imaginative, but we do need to think of alternative ways for people to get into the market and to live where they want to live, you know, without getting into these enormous levels mm. of debt, which have seemed to really characterise some markets at the moment. Yeah, I was uh, at a housing affordability conference a couple of weeks ago and and so there was a lot of presentations around communal models you know community models and trying to that and some of these architecturally led designs they've got waiting lists I mean there's you know three or four thousand people on waiting lists for the next projects that they're going to bring out so they really do and what they do and how they sort of approach it is they challenge the buyer about what they want in their apartment and so the second bathroom you know is it really absolutely necessary and then if it is, then we're going to charge you a premium on top of what a normal developer would because I'm we're going to make, you know, because you're taking up a little bit more space that we don't have and then make it cheaper. So you're on behalf of you wanting your second bathroom, we're going to make their apartment cheaper. Happy with that? Mm. And so there are people who are still happy with that, but ultimately it's, it is helping on the other side. So it's, it's, uh, it's still, I think, a profitable enterprise. But in some cases, that, that's going to be the new norm. And it's obviously what we're seeing in Europe where we are seeing these communal housing projects that are getting off the ground and trying to be more creative in, in the space that we use as opposed to just wanting McMansions everywhere. Any of the policy makers reach out to the likes of yourself um, with the insights that you do have, you know, on housing affordability, you know, they've made some changes to investment uh, in terms of depreciation. 
uh, in terms of what APRA is doing for lending. Are, are you ever part of the discussion in the landscape, whether you're you know, part of their advisory team, or is it largely just sort of tucked away in sort of dark rooms and we don't know about until we hear the policy? Yeah, no, look, definitely. I mean, they've got community, mm-hmm. not community, li- business liaison programs. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Reserve Bank in particular have got a, a, a really active one where they're constantly talking to a whole range of people as to what's happening in the market. Yeah. So, um, you know, so Reserve Bank is a good one. I mean, New South Wales government, this, you know, the, the federal government, all, all government bodies mm-hmm. do have liaison programs. And, you know, it's interesting talking to people. And they reach work- out to you? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, you know, we we are in talking more about how we can share data. You mm-hmm. know, there's there's a lot of discussion there. But mm-hmm. look, without a doubt, they do have some pretty good analytic people on board, and mm-hmm. Reserve Bank in particular. I mean, you know, the stuff that they're looking at is is pretty amazing. And when they make a decision, I'm really confident that they're making the right decision because I know how much they they research and analyse every situation in the in the Australian economy. Mm, very good, very insightful. There's some uh, key data that came out this week um, with CoreLogic. Any thoughts around that? Yeah, so the CoreLogic data started to show a, a bit of a resurgence in house price growth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think it was probably a little bit unexpected. It's been interesting, though, looking on our site that demand from April seems to sort of be going up and down every month. That we kind of had this surge up in demand up until then. It sort of dropped back in, in May, it surged in June, it dropped in July. You know, so it's kind of, you know, we're looking at it going, well, what is happening here? You know, <laughs> are people confident or they're not yeah. confident? And they seem to be changing. I think what's positive last month, we saw a kick up in listings and you know that was good news that was a big problem for us obviously as a company but it was also a problem for buyers out there that there wasn't anything for them to to buy Uh, and I think a lot of the 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 driver of that increase in listings was the fact that a lot of people thought the market was starting to slow that Mm. they felt confident that you know they sold in say last month in 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 July that they'd be able to buy in September and the market wouldn't have run away from them over Mm. that time Mm. so you know for us uh, you know, we, as a company, hope for a more stable market. You know, that's an ideal for us. Um, and, I, and I don't think anyone really wants house prices to be galloping along at 20% per annum. I mean, no. certainly not if you're a first home buyer. Even no. if you own property, it's mm. that level of instability it puts in the economy and, and for people's financial situations is, is not great. So so, so we're, we're just undirectional at the moment is probably, you know, like... I was the same. I'm thinking, here it is. Here's the, this is the dawn. That's it. But now it looks like, oh, it's a false dawn. Oh, no, here we go again. I mean, some of the data out of, out of New South Wales and Sydney in particular, listings have been up. So auction clearance rates or auctions, uh, you know, were up on last year's numbers. But we've got, and then it's like, okay, well, clearance rates are rising again. And it's like, how does this work? Whereas in Melbourne, it's pretty clear cut. There's been lower listings this time this year than last year and auction clearance rates are you know sort of sitting around the 80 percent so it is hard to read mm. it's um these last couple of months we we've we've gone directionless you know a bit of a rudder in terms of which way we're going to go yeah i mean it's also the, the whole economic situation too if yeah. you're the reserve bank trying to make interest rate decisions you get this strong jobs growth but then the dollar surges to 80 cents it's kind of like well what do i do to stay put there's mm. kind of no no reason i guess for me to move but it's the same with house prices i mean we just we don't know exactly what's happening at the moment. I mean, my sense is that it's slowing because we're getting that sort of up and down yep. in demand, yep. but things can kick back off pretty yep. quickly. And mm. I mean, if there was a cut for whatever reason, mm. you know, I think that would kick start again. Oh, yeah. so <laughs> I, think, I, think well, I don't think they would have <laughs> that sort of, you know, confidence to cut. I think they've learned their lesson yeah, in terms of that. And I mean, I'd love it because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, investors are getting hit with the majority of the burden here, um, so a, a cut could probably bring a little bit of relief for them. But if we if we're seeing a cut, it's usually because we're stuffed. Yeah, mm. you know the economy's not going well. So I'd much prefer to see it stay on hold and let let you know we we absolutely know it's going to cost more for investors. We know that they'll pass that on to us. Um, so we've got to be mindful of that and shop around and try and get the best deal. Uh, but be mindful for this uncertain period of the next few years, we're going to have this uh, disparity between owner-occupier interest rates and investor interest rates until someone comes in and, you know, puts some money on the table and says, I'm not going to do that. And then you'll see, if, you know, a flight to that money, I suspect, by investors. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or they drop off to such an extent that the government decides that they need to stimulate demand. I mean, yeah. and that happens. You know, yeah, we, we, we're looking at Australia where there's so much investor activity that, mm. you know, we can't ever imagine a situation that there wouldn't be enough investors. But you go to somewhere like Europe mm. or you go to the US, there's markets that they don't need more investors to provide that housing. Yeah, true. 
Uh, we, in terms of uh, around the grounds for the, for the country, we touched on Perth, but what, what's the, the summary of Perth? It, you know, bottomed out, looking looking up? What's Yeah, look, I, I think it's close to bottom. I mean, mm. we're not seeing a change in demand levels on our site. Uh, but there's, you know, there's some positive signs around growth in those premium western suburbs. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of those suburbs, you know, prices are going backwards in Perth, but they're jumping 15, 20%. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we have a look on site, the, the suburbs that are seeing high levels of demand are, are those western suburbs, those inner west, but also those northern beaches areas. So they seem to be jumping in terms of uh, buyer demand. You know, we think that will start to kick through to prices soon. So, you know, it's like any market, you know, you, you can be in a market that is completely dire, but there's always going to be somewhere that everyone wants to be. And, you know, in Perth, that's inner west, that's northern beaches. And well, It's an important point to make, first. I think, because, you know, um, we always talk about the macro doesn't help anyone. Um, you know, yes. a macro, like Perth as a macro. But, you know, we, um, we've we helped some clients get into the Adelaide market. And then initially someone will say, well, Adelaide, really? You know, mm. they've got manufacturing challenge. It's like, well... Yeah, but where we're buying, you know, those people that are vulnerable in those jobs aren't living there. And there's still a doctor and a dentist and a, you know, a a sales exec who are on good incomes and they enjoy the lifestyle of these these cities. So I think you make a really important point for the listener that there's so many sub-markets within a market. Generally, Perth's one one product, Mm. one customer. But you know, within within submarkets, there's still strength in. And you talked about the inner western suburbs. I, I, yeah, I was just going to concur. Go back and listen to that again. It just cements what we talk about. Is that um, usually um, when confidence is shifting, it's basically being led by the people who are the haves, mm. the ones who have got a little bit more discretionary nature. Because we, you know, think about it logically. They are the people who might be starting the businesses who are who are trying to get the economy kickstarted again. Then the flow-on effect is we then have the secondary jobs and the and the lower pay jobs kick on and that then flows out to those types of more affordable marketplaces. So it makes sense to me that that the lead will come from from the inner areas, but it, it's also on the flip side of that is at the very top end, so that top 25% quartile of those high-end markets, they get smacked around when the economic turmoil happens, the bonuses don't come through for the executives and there's less executive roles. They but even the blue chip stuff around that median price range is usually quite stable and doesn't bounce around as much. So, you know, these are all good lessons for looking inside a market to sort of say when is a good time to get into those areas. And if you're, you know, if you're one of those trailblazers, then maybe the inner west of, of um, Perth or, you know, the Northern Beaches corridor, which is a beautiful corridor. Not, now might be the time when you you don't have as much competition. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think if you were looking to buy Perth at the bottom of the market, you know, it's probably going to come, it, it's either there now or, mm. or within two years. And I think Perth, if you want to buy, be prepared to hold yep. for a few mm. years. Yep. But, Take you know, don't time, try yeah. and buy and sell within yeah. 12 months. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's not don't generally. speculate. <laughs> don't we don't like with speculating no one likes in property. Speculation. You won't make any money. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah, there are some opportunities there. So sorry, with that as a backdrop, then if we go to sort of Darwin, the macro discussion is that it's off. But is there is there sub markets that you're seeing in the Darwin or surrounding regions that are that are worthy of a look, or is yeah. there sort of a general story there? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Darwin's still pretty tough. I mm. mean, we, we saw we've seen a bit of an increase in uh, demand on site for for um, Northern Territory. Uh, the interesting thing for that area is kind of those northern suburbs of Darwin. Talking so, about Fanny Bay. <laughs> it's got the best beer garden in Australia. It's just so yeah. stunning there. Oh, it's yeah. a great little spot. Get a crocodile to come up <laughs> and uh, serve your second I'm not saying so rest your feet in the water whilst you're having a quiet <laughs> it's like that. It is just so beautiful and so, you know, underdeveloped. It it's just stunning. Yeah, it it's, my, it's my favourite spot to have a quiet beer after a day. Just yeah. love it. Yeah. 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 So there you go. Those yeah, are, there's that lifestyle fit. piece. That, yeah. Yeah, and also that. around the university. Yeah, okay. Seems to be yep. quite strong demand. Um, Are you it, up there much in Darwin? No, I'm not up there much. I, yeah. I, you know, I've never been there actually. I, I sort of know very well yeah, on the map. And studying, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always kind of studying it and Maybe looking at it. Maybe we need to do a so research yeah. trip up to yeah. Darwin. We'll, we'll, we'll do, do that. We'll, we'll go off to Fanny Bay while it's happening. Yes, Fanny Bay sounds like fun. That's a solve the economic problem with the beer. It's interesting actually. Rental demand started picking up in Alice Springs recently. And that was, you know, I mean, again, you know, such a tiny market. You could probably have one you know, new building project and suddenly you've got all these people having to move there and yeah. rent. So yeah. that could make a difference. Yeah. But rental demand's interesting because it is often uh, an area that is showing strong jobs growth because, you know, if you're someone moving to a city, you're not going to go straight in there and buy, you'll Great rent. Point. Mm. Yes. And you'll probably rent for a year or two and 
And yeah. Um, yeah, so those areas where we start to see that surge in rental demand tend to be jo- strong jobs mm-hmm. growth areas. Um, South Australia and specifically Adelaide, that, that, that sentiment's pretty strong, isn't it? It is strong, yeah. I mean, it's still, you know, it's, Adelaide's an interesting one. It just kicks along. Mm-hmm. You know, was, I was on this roadshow. Um, we went to Adelaide first and then we went to Perth. And, you know, people in Adelaide are kind of like, you know, the market's pretty good, it's kicking along. And, and, and it's probably not doing that well. But, you know, it hasn't had those heady highs that Perth had. Mm-hmm. You know, so Perth has had this amazing situation that's come right back down, whereas... Adelaide's kind of just kicked along. Uh, so, you know, fairly steady, steady demand levels. We do find those inner suburbs do very well. Unley, Unley is, mm-hmm. you know, the number one yeah. suburb on our site. Yeah. Uh, but also the Adelaide Hills. So Crafers mm-hmm. uh, keeps popping up yep. there as a, yep. a strong demand uh, location. Um, but, yeah, so Adelaide Hills, inner, inner Adelaide, you know, they seem to be the areas that people are interested in. I did a story um, for the 7.30 report, it's going to air this week, and it was largely about the local South Australian journalist was interested to see that Sydney money was moving into uh, into Adelaide, and the profile was one of our clients who'd actually uh, rent vesting in Woolloomooloo, couldn't couldn't afford to live there in a bull's roar, but you know, still wanting to, to park their money in a market that was in the right time of the cycle. Um, so they bought a great property in the inner west of uh, Adelaide, which we identified 18 months ago, Ben, as mm. um, as being a, a you know probably the last bastion of gentrification left on that uh, in, in Australia, and he's done really really well. But um, they were like, "Well, so how many of you guys are doing this?" It's like, "Yeah, we've been doing it for 18 months, and there's quite a few people that are doing it." So it was so it's interesting that that'll go to air this week and mm. um, to see that sort of positive light shone on there. But our research has always indicated that it's just been consistent, and we've got yeah. some you know our friend Peter Kaluzos who's um, who's built a substantial portfolio solely in that market and has chugged along beautifully very over well. time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, even apartments are interesting there that, um, you know, it's been quite a lot of apartment development, but there does seem to be a lot of older people moving mm. into those apartments. Okay. And again, you talk yeah. to developers, and they're like, yeah, older people like them because they still want to travel, go yeah. overseas, but they, you know, want to lock their car up and don't want the big garden. And, you know, so, you know, again, it's just a, it's a different market. Yeah, and, it is. But, it, yeah. you know, it sort of kicks along. And Same principles okay. apply there, don't they, Ben, in terms of, you know, we... We still buy the old um, 1970s, um, you know, two-level walk-ups or single-level walk-ups that are in blue chip and Unley and uh, Norwood and some of those inner hmm. blue chip suburbs. But then we try and pick up the houses in the um, in the inner west. And yeah, I, I mean. You could buy some stuff, um, you know. Bungalows. What are yeah, it's well under a mill. Yeah, oh, they're well, really, yeah, and they're really even, nice. We bought a four-bedroom, two-bathroom, two-car space, period home on 700 square metres in Prospect, which is three k's north, for just a tick over a million. I mean, try and try and <laughs> picture that in Melbourne <laughs> like, Sydney. be like a stunning yeah, no, period yeah. home. It's unbelievable. Yeah. But look, any, anywhere where, I mean, even the, the, the government, the state government there was obviously... Uh, they understand that construction jobs are important jobs because the flow-on jobs that come from property are around that. So they're looking at incentives to try and get developers the minimum quota that they need to get out of the ground. And all of a sudden, okay, well, that's 80 more people we've now got employed. You know, So that's that trade people that, you know, with the manufacturing jobs with Holden and those types of things sort of transitioning. These are the critical infrastructure projects that they need to try and you know re retool those particular people to to keep them there. Yeah. Otherwise, they're guess what? They're all going to put their rat tax on and head back to Sydney or Melbourne and try and get a job here. Mm. You know, because they're where the jobs are. Yeah. So they, they need to to stimulate that. So they're looking for some incentives to try and get them out of the ground. Yeah. I mean, South Australian government is interesting. I mean, they they are very pro property, yeah. and it's even interesting their attitude towards foreign buyers. We you know we see more property seekers from China looking at Adelaide than we see in Brisbane. Mm. And, you know, Adelaide isn't a big market, wow. but... Okay. Education? They're chasing the it, education. That's yeah. part of it, but the Health South Australian government is actively marketing the area as somewhere mm. to invest. And so you've got this very friendly government and, you know, they're not putting additional taxes on mm. foreign buyers. Mm. Um, but, you know, if I was a foreign buyer, you know, just say I wanted to buy in Canada and, the you know, the, the British Columbian government was very welcoming and friendly and saying put your money here, I'd feel pretty confident, you know, yeah. whereas if they're not, they're not friendly, yeah. you, you yeah. kind of, you know, yeah. it's a bit of a sovereign risk yeah. issue that, you know, you may be pushed out over time. time. <laughs> too much demand, move on, move yeah. on. <laughs> nothing to see here. That happens in the United States, <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> yeah. um, 
So we, we've sort of touched on um, Tasmania. We've touched on sort of southeast Queensland. Really, Canberra's left to sort of in, in the mix for discussion. Yeah, Canberra's doing amazing yeah. at the moment. Mm. It's seeing really strong price growth. And, um, you know, I think at the moment it's it's number two after Melbourne. So it's kind of going Sydney. Uh, sorry, Melbourne, Canberra, Sydney. Uh, demand from renters is always high mm. in, in Canberra. So as an investment destination, you know, you're fairly guaranteed if you buy something half decent, that you'll find someone to rent it. The only problem is you've got to give it all to the state government. So they their, afford the roundabouts. Their, their, their land tax is ridiculously... <laughs> if you're listening to the state government of Canberra, state oh. government, the territory government of Canberra, yeah. please do something about your land tax. I mean... No that, threshold. No threshold. It's crazy. Just, oh, you know, mm. two thirds of your rent goes to paying them. So if it doesn't hit your back pocket. Ben and yeah, I did a recognition not, not there. Not a great situation. No. We're talking to local agents. What's the ratio of uh, owner rocks to investors? Oh, probably 90 owner rocks, 10 of investors. The next agent, oh, probably 95 owner rocks, five. We've been scratching our heads going, this is... And then we find out. Second, <laughs> house, second <laughs> highest disposable household income. We get into the numbers and we... Oh, what, how much do they... Ch- that, look at that stamp. What? Land tax? What the... Yeah, land yeah. tax is more the rates. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Oh. So, yeah, that's your only problem there. Mm. Very good. I mean, so... Uh, Any other little smoky markets? Regional, Geelong? Uh, regional. You... Uh, yeah, Geelong, you know, particularly around the, the train stations yep. to Melbourne. You know, yep. they seem to be really picking up and we, we're seeing pretty strong demand on site. Newcastle? Uh, Newcastle's good, yeah. I mean, we're starting to get to quite a few suburbs hitting over a mil. I think there's around five suburbs now yeah, okay. hitting over a million dollars. So affordability issues mm. pushing and, up. And the gong? Wool and gong? Yeah, gong's very... Going, yeah, going, going really well. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a terrific... Lifestyle oh, amazing. You know, jump on the train yeah. and get up to I know. Um, so, yeah. yeah, it was Central Coast last year. This year seems to be all about Wollongong. Yeah. So it's, um, and so general Central demand. Coast again, pretty strong. Yeah, Central. It's, it's, you know, when we look at where people are moving because of affordability, Melbourne, it does seem to be sort of outer north east. Yep, okay. We're seeing, or east as well. There's yep. strong demand there. When we look in Sydney, though, it does tend to be north central coast. Yep, and, and okay, Terrigal up through that area. Yeah. Yep, okay. Rightio. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Very good, but there's uh, wow. We went straight to the top. I mean, I was going to ask you when you go to the um, to the economic powwows for you know the economics club that you're a part of. Is there is there many um, females that you get to rub shoulders with, or is there a lot of sort of um, stale old men? Stale. <laughs> well, yeah. Is that what is that what you say? <laughs> well, I was, uh, I was trying to think of a better more. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what you're thinking. We've got, we've got narratives vibrant and dynamic and energetic, yeah. and so, uh, are there other people like you in the? Yeah, look, yeah. There, there are a lot of women, a yeah. lot right. of female economists. You yeah. know, they're not as, as haven't been as vocal, I guess. Mm. Okay. traditionally but you know they're moving through the ranks and uh it is it is you know does seem to be growing i mean we're still seeing very few young people study mm. economics mm-hmm. in general mm-hmm. um but you know I they're, all more... coding. <laughs> they're coding they're, they're all going into coding there's <laughs> right. more money in coding have I you read know. the book for economics yes i love that book How yes. good is it? <laughs> it's and so then good the, and economics is a study of human incentives it kind of yeah it's fascinating and i think that's the thing with economics you know a lot of people think it's all about interest rates and gdp mm. and unemployment mm. but you know for me the the really interesting stuff is is that human interaction with the economy and with mm. money and how people's behavior changes and mm. you know on our site is fascinating to see behavior change because you know not only does it respond to things becoming more expensive but you know lifestyle elements sort of change over time too Mm. that people Mm. have stronger preferences for some locations Mm -hmm. so do you have any of your keynotes you talk about sumo wrestlers and um, drug dealers and uh, teachers (laughs) like they do in free no i wonder how i can link them to property i'll have to have a think about that we have a big (laughs) mac index for property (laughs) (laughs) or as you say the crust pizza index (laughs) (laughs) Uh, very good well uh, it's always a pleasure having you on doing what you do very very well and giving everyone a uh, an understanding of what's happening around the market so as always we appreciate um you giving up your time to come on the couch thanks for having me it's a pleasure now ben um because uh you and i rabbited on a bit at the beginning i thought oh, i mindfully went over my mindset minute because we wanted to go straight into our very special guest sounds good but um uh, narrative this week we had um, one of our team present to us we have what's called an eat and learn where our, our divisions get together and you know, learn a little bit about the business that they might not think about. And we changed gears because um, uh, one of our team, Lloyd, decided that um, uh, he was he was tossing up where his future might lie. And uh, it was really interesting in terms of mindset. So I thought it'd be a, a good one for our listeners because yeah. the material that he was talking about is um, uh, left hand up means happy in the now, right hand up means got a vision for the future. And what he realised is he was having a challenge that he was really happy in, in the moment, happy fulfilling client briefs but really had no vision for the future. And um, so he, uh, once he realised that, it sort of um, 
had this inward look um, as to where he wanted to go and actually did a U-turn on, on one of the choices that he was going to make in his career. So left hand up, happy in the now, right hand up is the vision for the future. And if you've got both hands up, you're in this bending reality space, which is which is a really, really cool mm. space to be. So the, the point of this is um, you can get stuck in the current reality trap is what, what, what the material calls. If I've got my left hand up, I'm happy in the now, but no vision for the future because happiness can be really fleeting. So um, he, his conclusion was long-term happiness and fulfillment come from you know, something more, the need to contribute, the need to grow, and the need to do meaningful things. And I think um, the reason I say that is because for Ben and I, when we started the podcast, we, we felt this need to contribute to our community. We've um, got a lot of people who listen to the podcast and they've made better decisions for their own investment. But it's true, we were, we were happy in, in our portfolio, but we wanted to sort of pay that forward and. Uh, um, I guess contribute a bit more meaningfully to um, to our community. So I thought it was. It was oh, look! I was just going to add to that. I'm um, a shout out to the to the, who was the author of that public. Uh, Vish, Vishen Lakiani. It's yeah. um, uh, the, the the code of the extraordinary mind was the, the book. The code of the extraordinary mind. So mm. that's obviously where that thinking comes from, and you can get it in a in an audio book where he talks about it. So it is really really powerful stuff. I mean, ultimately, we've got to be happy. Money's not going to make you happy. So make sure you're finding ways of, of living now and planning for the future as well and getting that, that curve, that bend for the big smile. That's where I thought he was going to go with it when I was listening to the audio file. And, you know, that's bending this reality. Yeah, yeah. Thing, like a beautiful Here comes smile. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. waiting for that. No, yeah. didn't happen. Just, got, just bending the reality. <laughs> Both hands up. <laughs> it's like... But there's a shout out to our listeners, Ben. It's not just about happiness in the now. It's about yes. how you can contribute, how you can grow um, and do some meaningful things, Brilliant. Um, which is terrific. Great message. Hey, um, my um, life fact is very, very simple today, Ben, in the interest of, uh, of, the interest of time. You like a glass of wine? I like wine, yeah. You do like a glass of wine? Do you know when you want to chill it, you put a glass of wine? Why didn't you ice? ask me that? You know, <laughs> like a glass of wine. Well, I think... Just just, just, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I think just, I'll, sorry. just pick, sit back at, in Darwin, <laughs> feet dangling with the crocs, having a glass of wine. I can't see that. Um, so if you want to chill your wine, freeze some grapes, pop the grapes into your wine, chills the thing, doesn't dilute the water. There you go, Ben. Go to the bank oh, on that one. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen that happen. I think my mum has demonstrated that on many of occasions. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, so, no, so you know, I've just had a quick chat with your mum for that long, <laughs> which is brilliant. So there you go. There's a back, folks. Freeze your grapes, put them in your wine. Did, Did you, you know, know? Bryce? <laughs> Did you know? Guinness Book of World Records are the, are the most stolen books from public libraries. Did you know? Public libraries. The Guinness Book of World Records. The Guinness Book of World Records that goes into the public library. A big, thick book in it. They don't, they don't bring, people don't bring it back. They obviously enjoy it that much. Well, clearly they're going for a record on how many they you know can what? steal so they can get should, in the book. I probably should steal one so I can get a few more did you knows <laughs> because there's some Guinness Book of World Records in there. So that's that's one of them. As long as they're not stealing the Archie Guide, probably investing like that. So. Yes, that's true. We've got to keep that one on the shelves. Okay, here we go. Um, if you try to suppress a sneeze, you can rupture a blood vessel in your head or neck and die. Is that true? Mm. That, well, it's, it's on tip. my little, little <laughs> health tip. A nutrition fact it says here, but yes, health tip I think is probably a better. Uh, so that and the last one. So because you know, so please let it go, let it go. I mean, try and you know, grab a grab a handkerchief, whatever you need to do, but just let it flow. Okay, next one here. The average person walks the equivalent of three times around the world in their lifetime. Wow. That's a, oh, that is, that's someone telling that's me you better impressive. start walking. <laughs> and I'm uh, last. Did you know? Three times around. Three that's, times that's around. That's the impressive. That's, that's impressive, impressive research, Ben. And did you know? Narrative probably thinks that we're not that credible anymore after the uh, the, the end of this podcast. But um, <laughs> very good research there, mate. I, I really yeah, appreciate that. But uh, again, Narrative, uh, we love having you on. We love the insights. Uh, again, safe travels back to Sydney. Check out our video on realestate.com.au. Yeah. Have you seen it? I have. Oh, very good videos. Oh, thank any, you. Any any chance we can get you on the couch and we'll do a little, uh, <laughs> sure, yeah. little collaboration with the chief economist at yeah, the REA on, 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 the, sure. on the big red yeah. couch. Oh, well, there you go. You heard it here, folks. Yeah, yeah, the one that we pump up. So when you see us get off, it bounces. <laughs> it's, it's, it's made of air. Maybe we're doing Sydney and stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh, great idea. Well, there we go. go. So on whose um, budget is that? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Out of the economist budget. Yeah, exactly. But um, until next week, Ben. See you later. Oh no! Oh, that is to say. See, you almost got me there, didn't you? Remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. But until next week, see you later. See you later.